Okay. Uh, all right, you guys can go ahead. All right, so we're going to be going over the high altitude uh, ballooning projects for our annular solar eclipse. Uh, back in October, we went to Pearsall, Texas. Uh, the goal of our flight was to weather to see if our balloons can reach our target altitude of approximately 26,000 meters or 85,000 feet. Uh, we also wanted to evaluate the performance of our vent and cut down system. We had an issue with our venting system during this eclipse. Uh, we couldn't send any of our open and close commands, and uh, we were tracking its altitude at the time, and it kept ascending. It eventually hit 106,000 feet before we lost, uh, before it finally burst, and then we noticed the ascent rate dropped, so it fell back down. So we weren't able to test the cut down system either. Uh, we also wanted to test the connectivity with the satellite Iridium modem and our RFD 900, our Raspberry Pi camera, our 360 Insta camera, antenna, ground station, spot tracking. And we also wanted to measure the variation of ozone during this solar eclipse. Uh, these are the two flight lines we had, uh, our first balloon being Osprey. It had a standard flight line with our parachute, radar reflector, pterodactyl, Iridium modem, our RFD 900, and our 360 camera. We also have the our own additions with our UNF Miglio and our gas sensors, which we'll go over in a little bit. Uh, our Osprey, Osprey balloon had 8.3 pounds, and our Disney flight line had only 3.8. Uh, and the FFA approved the NOTAM permissions a day before our launch, and the ATC approved the final go 10 minutes before the flights. So here you can see the flight tracks, both in 2D and 3D, of Disney and Osprey flight. Uh, we launched just southwest of San Antonio, Texas. You can see the 2D track, and underneath that, the uh, altitude track. Um, the three-dimensional flight path can be seen on the bottom there, that blue uh, ascent path. It basically did an S. Uh, that was the prediction. We were wanting to float on that first hook. However, uh, we were not able to send vent commands, so it hooked back up uh, past the target altitude of roughly 80,000 feet and burst at 106, like we spoke about previously, and then hooked back down uh, after burst. Here, this is the flight data from our balloon launches, the altitude at the top left and the pressure on the bottom left. They both coincided nicely. Um, something interesting to note is the difference in ascent rates based on uh, the weight of the payloads. And something we also found interesting was these are moving horizontally at great speeds, much faster than what you may uh, anticipate. Uh, both balloons at 145 kilometers per hour and 159 kilometers per hour on the ground. Um, and then as we spoke about earlier, the Iridium network did not respond to any of our signals that we sent during the flight. And what we noticed after we recovered the payloads, um, it almost appeared like the commands were sitting in queue just waiting and they all executed one after the other, as if they were like clogged in the system, I guess you could say, after recovery, the vent started opening. Here we can see, get rid of this, I can't see. How do you like, having some technical difficulties. Oh. Yeah, we can't see our slides. Sorry, guys. Oh, okay. Temperature variations. We can see our temperature and humidity variations from the payloads. Um, you can see the differences between internal and external, denoting the effectiveness uh, of the insulations. The internal temperature is always slightly higher, but following the same trend as the external temperature. And the humidity goes to basically zero at altitude, which is verified by the bottom graph. And these this data was collected on the Miglio board that was designed here at UNF. <clears throat> In addition to the program's payloads flown, we designed our own 
to facilitate ozone measurements. Dr. Patel here um, at the UNF designs and iteratively improves his ozone sensors that can be seen on the top left there. There's actually eight sensors that work on resistivity and that changes as it's exposed to ozone. The Arduino based, uh, the Mega based microcontroller can see in the bottom right. Um, the board that we designed basically uh, stacks on top of an off the shelf Arduino Mega and works like a shield. And that facilitates pressure, humidity, temperature, GPS, and supporting data to facilitate the interpretation of the ozone measurements. So going into uh, some of the data collected during our flight, uh, this was gathered during the eclipse, uh, as you can see in the top right, uh, as the the UV index decreased during the eclipse. Uh, I believe someone who presented in the first section uh, proved this as well. Uh, an interesting thing that we gathered was that uh, using Dr. Patel's ozone sensors, as the UV index decreased, you can clearly see that the concentration of ozone during the flight also decreased uh, as we reached the maximum of the eclipse. And then coming back up, uh, near the end of the eclipse, we saw the concentration of ozone come back up. This data was then um, compared to something that some of the data we gathered over the summer on the HASP flight. Uh, you could see during the flight, uh, during the day, here we had uh, some bad ozone in the troposphere, uh, measuring good ozone in the stratosphere. And then once we reach altitude, we start measuring the UV index fall during the nighttime and here on this side, you can see that uh, ozone concentration begins to decrease as the UV index decreases throughout the day, falling into the night. So some of the things that uh, were apparent during this mission, some of the conclusions, uh, both Osprey and Disney successfully launched. Uh, we hit our target altitude minus uh, achieving a float. Um, we did have problems with the Iridium network. Uh, I know we weren't the only problems uh, we're working on that right now. Uh, the Raspberry Pi camera and 360 camera successfully recorded videos. We have a lot of footage from this 360 camera. Uh, I know Dr. Patel has that somewhere. I believe we'll be sharing that. To, or we might have already shared it. Uh, the RFD 900 worked well. The pterodactyl, the P pterodactyl did not. Um, uh, we started losing signal at 50,000 feet. Uh, some. Other conclusions, uh, the comparison of ozone data between our flight in October and the past flight early in the year, uh, the data is, was gathered was very good. We were able to compare the results and we're pretty confident that the sensors were working pretty much the same. Uh, these results uh, helped us gather experiences and we hope to improve our experience and for the launch in April. And students in SSE uh, were able to gain a lot of real world experience during this flight as well. <clears throat> um, in terms of outreach, we also have done a few lectures um, mentioning to like the freshman class regarding the project, but our experiences with NASA and EP um, has inspired us to create our own um, um, a student club called the Space Science and Engineering SSE. Um, it's still in the very early stages of the club, so there has been very few limited club launches considering we had just created the club last um, last fall, but we continue to move forward with, the, hopefully with the projects um, after NEPP. But last but not least, we also wanted to um, thank um, Dr. J uh, Dr. Jadeep, Maria, and Vina, as well as Dr. Angela, and especially uh, Krudi and Akimi, who personally came down during, before the first eclipse uh, to personally train us uh, regarding the logistics in launching a balloon as well as the technical difficulties that we had acquired before launching the official balloon. All right, and that takes us into questions. Any questions for the group? I have one. This is uh, Eric Abramson from St. Catherine University. Uh, uh, where is your ozone sensor? So this is maybe my ignorance and understanding ozone, but somebody told me to not even explore the uh, 
the ozone. I was looking at doing ozone myself a number of years ago, and somebody said it's a it's a it's a folly if you're sending up styrofoam payloads to even try to study ozone. So, um, I just how are you addressing that issue if it is even an issue, and help me better understand it if if I'm misunderstanding that. So. Yeah, I, I believe this is a problem that we we discussed with Dr. Patel as well. Uh, he He's more of a professional with his sensors. They're his patented sensors. Uh, the outgassing from the foam, we never measured it. Uh, Dr. Patel, I know you're in here. Uh, maybe you can help him answer his question a little bit as well. Okay, so <clears throat> we, we, we used uh, a different type of a payload body, which minimized the outgassing. And the outer surface of the ozone sensor exposed to the outer side. And nearby, we don't keep any plastic materials, which outgas easily. And we, we tested every year the same thing in our HASP payload every year. And we, we try to avoid those materials from very beginning. So it sounds like it is a problem, but you can deal with it to some degree. Yes, yes. So we try to improve our sensitivity of the oxidizing ozone gas, which can uh, minimize those effects of reducing gas. And we also attach a reducing gas sensor in the same payload just below. And we notice that those reducing gas are very, very low, like a negligible compared to the change in oxidizing gases. Uh, we have a ozone uh, sounding program here, one of the few sites in the country at uh, at the uh, here in the uh, University of Alabama, Huntsville, Alabama. And uh, um, fortunately, unfortunately, we don't fly them much anymore. But Dr. Newchurch uh, flies them here, and uh, and the students, quite a few of them are from the Space Harbor Club. Um, it would be really interesting uh, to fly an ozone sonde along with your ozone sensor and compare yes. the data. And I'll, uh, be, I think I'll I... be happy to provide that one. Good, I'll great. I'll be happy to provide that one, but I'm also working with another professor from University of Colorado. She going to launch uh, a, a balloon flight from the Arctic during this summer. And uh, along with the ozone sensor, uh, 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 we're going to also put our ozone sensors. Yeah, the, we've done. There, so we're going to compare that time in June. Yeah, that would be great. We have ozone sons here. Uh, they're the, the ECC ones, and uh, they bubble the gas through a potassium iodine uh, cell. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, um, and they did a campaign over Lake Michigan this summer with 15 ozosons they launched. So wow. uh, uh, I think uh, that would be a great collaboration with Dr. Yes, Newchurch. Yes, yes. I'll get in touch with Dr. Newchurch and the students. And uh, I'm going to share my email ID here in the bottom. All right. Excellent. Okay. And then Ashton, I know you've got your hand raised. You want to ask your question? Yeah, just a quick question about the pterodactyl. You said it lost signal after 50,000 feet, and I'm wondering, did the pterodactyl turn off or did the GPS stop working? Um, so what actually happened with that is the GPS stopped working. Uh, we hit 50,000 feet and then the system cut out. Uh, when I looked at the data sheet, uh, what I found is that we didn't have the proper configuration. So once we hit 40,000, cut back out. And once we descended below that, it turned back on. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Did you guys uh, do, did you guys do video streaming? You talked about your Raspberry Pi collected data, but was that data sent to the ground? Based on the flight track, the predicted flight track, um, we chose to position our ground station in a place that would hopefully make connection during the float. And since we never caught that float, our ground station was never in range to uh, receive live data, uh, live video feed. In the future, I think um, that we are going to plan to position that to catch the flight, uh, the video on the way up on the ascent, rather than betting on the fact that we can get a float, because that prediction is a little bit more uh, based on too many variables that have to go right. 
Sure, I agree with that. So I've encouraged people, in fact, don't count on the float. If you get it, that will help. If you don't get it, hopefully you won't be completely, in your case, out of range. Yes. Yeah, but we got the we got the good video throughout throughout the flight. That's great. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you uh, for your presentation. Great presentation. Um, yeah, thank you very much.